everyone. Welcome to the Comics Who Show. Well, hey everybody. Welcome back. Uh, this is our second issue, our second episode, as you call it. So great to great to see everybody. I'm uh, Curtis Fujita. I'm a kung fu instructor. I'm the head instructor of Tiger Crane Kung Fu. I'm also a comic book artist and artist worked in video games, animation, things like that. I'm currently, the creative director at Silverline Comics and the creator of the upcoming comic book Shadow Ghost. Master. I'm Patrick Lugo, former art director at Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine, illustrator, author mostly of articles and movie reviews, and uh, comic creator. So, you know, keeping in the spirit of all things that are Kung Fu, but also that are comic book and comic book pop culture, including comic book movies, uh, we wanted to talk about the Venom sequel, uh, Venom Let There Be Carnage. Did, did it ever irk you? Because I, I, I haven't seen this this sequel. I saw the first one. You know, and I understand legality and licensing and agreements and all that kind of stuff aside, but it, it did kind of bother me that they weren't able to have Venom originate within the Spider-Man universe proper. I know they're, they're trying to kind of knit it together between, you know, Sony Pictures and, you know, Marvel Studios and all that kind of stuff, but but to me, Venom is from the Spider-Man universe, and, and his his character, you know, the, the symbiote, you know, to me, always should go through Peter Parker first. But um, I don't know. That, that's just how I feel. I don't know. What what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I would tend to agree. You know, I mean, you can kind of see the skeleton. I mean, you know, when writing my reviews, I definitely had to. Uh, devote some time into really spotlighting a lot of the marketing dynamics that were around that uh, that spawned a character like Venom. You know, like the 90s were very much about those extreme, cool anti-heroes and Venom is such a good example of it. But then the fact that Venom, that black and white costume was just born out of a toy line for the Secret Wars miniseries of the 80s, you know? And yeah. it's like, it's like, so like Venom has just been a character that's just been uh, one marketing plan stacked on another marketing <laughs> plan stacked on another marketing plan, you know? <laughs> and so that seems to hold true for the movie as well, where it's just sure. all about trying to make the most out of that, you know, that, that IP. No, def definitely. That's a, that, that's a that, that that's a very good point, you know. And um, yeah, I, I you know it's always funny, you know, when when I was working in the comic book industry, it was in in the you know in when I'm from Malibu Comics, I was working in the '90s, mid to late '90s, and yeah, it was just so funny. We used to have. Um, spreadsheets of just different character names if anybody wanted a character they could look up you know these character names everything was blood and death blood death dark blood and that was like all the books then it was like one of those three words death blood and dark had to be somewhere in there right and so it's, it's just so 90s you know oh yeah i mean and that's 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 after they you know run out of the various single word nouns <laughs> as a name you know <laughs> Of yeah. which Venom, Spawn, uh -huh. Cable, and a handful of others are all just built around, you know. Gone are the days of Amazing Man, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then I remember they would like actually just spell things wrong. Like if somebody had had the rights to Blood Wolf, B-L-O-O-D, Wolf, it would be B-L-U-D-D, Wolf, right? I mean, yeah. right. Like, oh, I think I see our guest coming in. So... All right, Curtis, I want to I want to introduce you to someone special, our, our guest today. He's someone that I've, I've uh, worked with in the past. We've, uh, you know, he's a, a stalwart member of the uh, the Kung Fu Wu Lin, right? The Kung Fu Forest. So um, let me introduce with, to you to Jose Figueroa. Um, maybe you could give us and our, our vast audience of a handful, you know, a little <laughs> introduction of who you are, where you've been, and how, how you ended up here. Well, um, uh, my name is Jose Manuel Figueroa, uh, originally from Santurce, Puerto Rico. Uh, basically, proud Boricua, you know, been a part of um, just doing uh, interesting work with Tai Chi, I guess. And, and I think my, my uh, claim to fame has been really having a great teacher that came from China at a certain time that 
uh, I was very interested and in, in physically able to do Tai Chi. Uh, and in that process of learning this traditional discipline, I was able to contribute, you know, along with my Kung Fu brother, Stefan Berwick, uh, you know, some, some really great information to help facilitate teaching Tai Chi in North America. You know, and I think that's one of the, the things that we, that I personally loved about the, the discipline itself is what it provided for me uh, on all planes, but also what it was able to provide for young people um, in the public city schools of New York City. So that was one of the things that we did. We wrote a, a book called the um, uh, Tai Chi for Kids, uh, Tuttle Publications, that uh, a really wonderful illustra illustration, you know, uh, with, the, with, the paper, with the hardcover kind of booklet. And the goal was to get that into every public school in North America. And, but, you know, the physical aspect of doing that by yourself, not having enough people, you know, it get daunting. And, uh, but, you know, but shout out to actually a company named uh, Scan New York, uh, the support of Children's Advocacy Network. They were like a not-for-profit that did work with uh, special needs uh, families and people that, you know, needed help. And uh, Lou Zuckerman was the executive director of the company. Renee Avery was my boss, and they just allowed and facilitated some really amazing things with Tai Chi. And it started with just Tai Chi, but then it became something bigger. And what we were doing in Harlem, it was bringing a collective of martial arts of all styles onto a stage filled with 600 kids, like screaming, you know, because they were watching a lion dance, you know, on stage. And we were introducing them to Chinese culture. Uh, there was capoeira, there was a little bit of everything. And, and Scan New York was behind all of that. You know, Lou was one of the guys that facilitated that. And at one point, I even was able to bring in my Tai Chi, the Yang style master, Master Derek Trent. And I brought him with Master Ren Guang Yi, my Chen style master. And there was a big Tai Chi performance with both styles on stage. And it was really magical, you know. Um, right, right. But we kind of just jumped into the middle. I want to hear a little bit about your the, the, the early Jose when he was just oh, young. Wow. First, well, uh, I'm, I'm sure you were watching Black Belt Theater like the two of us were. When we were <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what, uh, well, what? actually, when, when I came from Puerto Rico, um, I was around eight and something. And you know, but I, my kids, I, I grew up in Puerto Rico with my grandmother. My brothers grew up in New York with my grand, with my parents, and so I didn't really get to connect with my brothers until I was around eight-ish or twelve, or you know, was, I can't even remember. But I know when I got to New York, I speak English. I, you know, I, was, I spoke only Spanish. I didn't understand English. You know, so it was a very culture shock for me. Uh, as I got further along, my brothers, you know, embraced me and what have you. And you know, I assimilated into Western culture. Uh, cut to music. Um, I'm listening to bomba plena, percussion music in Puerto Rico. And I hear this, this little bodega, like around the corner in the neighborhood. And it turns out it's like a little candy shop. And my best friend at the time, that he came he became my best friend, was a guy named Jojo Santiago, right? So basically, um, Jose Santiago, but his name is Jojo, nickname. And later he became the founder of the Rocksteady crew. I just wanna, I just wanna say that I'm really happy to see something like this. You know, where I come from, we didn't have these opportunities. You know, I did it in the streets where the cops were driving by and things were happening and you had to get out of the way. But I like the fact that you got this unity. I was just feeling anything that was going on here. You're a very good teacher, man. What happened in the 70s is the dance itself was developing. You know, everything was very pure and organic. We kind of took what we saw and we kind of like played with it and added a few more gymnastic moves and, and more acrobatic moves. The other inspiration was kung fu movies. Like we, every Saturday we go to Foy Duop, Foy Second Street in Times Square, and we spend all day watching six, seven kung fu movies. Sometimes we would imitate how they fought and kind of utilize those methods in the way we moved without dancing, but with a different kind of rhythm. And then there's also the idea of being Puerto Rican and, and utilizing 
the dance steps from salsa, mambo, and things like that, that have a, a direct influence on us because we are Puerto Rican, Dominican, Cuban, whatever. And so we were like first generation Rock City Crew B-Boys. And he was my first mentor, you know, as part of that. And, you know, we went to this karate school called uh, Davidson Community Center Karate School. And, you know, we, we had an interest in martial arts and we had an interest in hip hop. And for me, that's always something that really always connected, really kind of linked up in a really cool way. And so Jojo, uh, you know, cut to like present day, we ran into each other through a mutual friend, a guy named Warrington Hudlin, who's a huge fan of martial art. He has something called the Fist and Sword series at the Museum of Moving Image. And he facilitated a reunion with myself and Jojo. And we did a presentation on the effects of hip hop and Kung Fu, uh, both in cinema and, you know, and, and you know, uh, Shin Ka, a friend of ours, he was a film guy, Asian brother from uh, New York City. He came through, the, uh, all the Rocksteady crew fellas came through. Uh, you know, we, we showed uh, the movie True Legend. Um, and I'm gonna tell you, man, uh, the, the, to have the Rocksteady crew guys watching that movie, and I already seen the movie a hundred times, but it was the perfect movie to show them because I'm a huge fan of Kung Fu and I'm a huge fan of hip hop. So in this movie, Jay Chow, right? Uh, th there's a couple of characters that are doing it. He becomes a Tai Chi drunken master, you know, uh, the Sante monk, what have you. And he teaches some drunken style. And at the end of the film, uh, David Carradine plays kind of this streaming circus guy. And he has this group of wrestlers, Western wrestlers, fighting against this guy who later becomes, you know, that monk. Uh, he's like, you know, Wang Fei Hong, Feng uh, Tai Yip, all those types of characters. And uh, Donnie Yen played him in, in, as this particular character in Beggar So. Beggar So. So anyway, he's supposed to be this Beggar So. And in the middle of his fight, he breaks out and starts doing windmills, like breakdancing windmills. The audience reacted you remember back in the days when we used to see kung fu movies and the, it was that reaction and the, the entire they lost it and, and warrington was ecstatic about it because it's like that's what we you know that's what we love about kung fu movies if they can make you feel that and you know so true legend was you know it's a mixture of five deadly venoms meets this you know had all these different layers and people were fans and, uh, but the B-Boys, they were like old timers B-Boys and they loved the hip hop aspect of the film. And so did I, I loved that film for that reason. But that was an experience, you know, and, and we documented it. It was uh, Jojo and I, we reconnected. He brought his family, I had my family there. And, and Warrington is a patron of, of both cultures. You know, we were able to really do some great work uh, trying to cover, you know, that history. But the, the hip hop always kind of worked its way into what later was my interest was through the Chinese martial art, you know, and you know. Um, and so Master Ren is, has been really a, a huge influence on me. Um, but in addition to Master Ren, there's my Kung Fu brother, Stefan Berwick. And, you know, we are a mutual friend of all of ours. And Stefan was, you know, my mentor in more of the <clears throat> contemporary wushu, traditional uh, long fist, basic weapons, you know, and his background and training was with the Bosun Mark family, which is um, Bosun Mark herself, his, uh, the mother of Donnie Yen, um, and uh, Chris Yen, his Tai Chi sister, Kung Fu sister. And, and there are people that are the vanguards, you know, for, for bringing, I would say, Chinese martial arts to Westerners uh, in a way when it was inaccessible. Uh, they broke a lot of ground. And, you know, and one of the beautiful things that Bosun Mark also brought was the influence of uh, Eastern art, stage, Peking opera, things that, that you would typically not see here in the West and popularized it. Uh, and, you know, comes, this is something I didn't know, but Stefan brought it up and he mentioned that the, a mutual friend of ours, Fred Ho, he actually uh, was a huge fan of Postal Mark and what she was doing. And he adopted her philosophy, creating a production uh, based on like the legends of Kung Fu, starting with the Monkey King. So he, it was this great concept with Su Wong Kong. It was this amazing theatrical production using jazz music uh, as opposed to you know, the traditional Chinese music, but he combined it. It was combined traditional Chinese music with jazz. So it was, it was really avant-garde you know, theater. And me, Stefan, et cetera, were a, a very you know, interesting part of that. Uh, so it's the way it worked is Stefan introduced me to Fred Ho and then later he told me that Bosun Mark was his influence, 
you know, I found that out years later. Um, and then what the cool thing was that there, there was a, uh, a love and a passion for Chinese martial art. Me, I was a huge fan myself. And we were at a production for Avon Davis Hall at City College of New York. And there was a show called Warrior Sisters. And it was a, it was a opera, right? A martial arts opera. And uh, at the lead was a person, uh, a team, of group, a group of Asian brothers names. The, the name of the group is Slant. Uh, Slant. Uh, S A L um, S L A N T, right? And they were a, a stage performance trio that did like amazing work. Um, you know, it, it was just great theatrical, but Fred Ho was again one of those mentors that we all looked up to him, and that was part of kind of the, the, the type of art that was coming out of uh, Asian Americans that were, you know, tired of the stereotypes and, you know, and they were creating a, a, a voice and artistry. So out of that group was a brother named Perry Yun. Uh, and Perry became, was the first guy that I worked with uh, when we were doing a show at Lincoln Center in 1997. Uh, and it was the first rendition of a voice, what later became Voice of the Dragon, which is a martial arts ballet that Fred Ho produced and uh, Columbia artists toured it. Uh, it, was, it was a great production. And it was extremely rare for, for that to be the case. It was not, a production that was produced in Asia. It wasn't. It was produced here, and it was with a com combination of all the ethnicities coming together to make this one thing happen. Jose, I was wondering if you could comment because some of our viewers are, are more from the comic book world, not necessarily. Oh, excellent! Book. Yeah, yes. And so, so the idea of Tai Chi, you know, um, you know, you know, I I, I teach Honga and I, I also do some Tai Chi, but even when I started, there's a very strong misconception, especially here in the West, about Tai Chi. Usually, when you say Tai Chi, most people think, oh, old people practicing right right absolutely I, I, I martial that. art they, they, they say what what type of martial art is this? but if you have a chance to investigate it, it's a phenomenal martial art i don't know if you could kind absolutely. of comment a little bit uh, about that, everybody absolutely. about i uh, would love to actually um yeah i am um, I, I personally love chen tai chi because of um my personal feeling of it you know I, I i love aesthetically what it looked like uh but then when you go deeper and, and you research and you do it more and longer you understand it as the martial discipline and in there there's a, a, a an array of techniques a plethora of techniques that are based on uh locking uh so this uh, in the in this order uh, true tai chi boxing would be trap lock break throw in that order not necessarily in that order but it's, it's more ideal in that way so the trapping part would be uh so think of a roman greco wrestler or well, Gracie Jiu Jitsu guy, and what they do on the floor, and that's actually the, the type of fighting you would do using Tai Chi principles, where uh, someone, let's say, is trying to grapple or trap someone that, let's say, is a, a you know expert in the Tai Chi system, Chen style system. It, it, if you can think of a conveyor belt, it's a conveyor belt that's just kind of bringing the joint from the wrist to the elbow to the shoulder, and once you get through those good conveyor positions, something's going to snap, right? And that's actually the design of the film, of, of, the, of the style, you know? Uh, and, th and the same thing I explained with the arms applies to the knee, the hip, and the ankle. Uh, and then the spine and the central upper thoracic cavity, the lower lumbar, and the, the positioning of the body as a martial artist, like any martial art, you know, it's all about footwork. You know, your footwork has got to be in the right places. So you're using your torso and your body as a lever to, to basically create a very forceful and powerful swai jiao uh, uh, throwing, which is a kind of a Chinese wrestling style that, that uh, is not typical to only Chen Tai Chi, but it's actually one of its ancestors, uh, you know, connected. And, you know, and, and, I, and I, I actually personally have a, a, an affinity for Hanga because there was a love of that system because of Gordon Liu. Like, I'm a huge Gordon Liu fan. So when I got to meet him in person, man, and it, he came to New York, he saw our show, we, you know, he was uh, ecstatic about a stage production that showed martial arts on stage. And of course the jazz was, was phenomenal because he'd never seen anything like that. And and I, we got lucky because he didn't realize that, you know how they pick people from the audience? They go, hey, we need somebody for the audience. And they put me in there with one of the guys that was in my show. And, and, and he, it was, a, it was a bit, you know, he's going to show a technique in movies. You know, in the movies, we used to do this. And he says, and he teaches me and my friend a technique. And it's a simple combination. And we do it easy. 
And he's excited because he says, wow, you guys pick up quick. And then somebody whispers in his ear, hey, man, that's the choreographer for the show you just saw. You know, and, and he was so cool about it. Uh, and so then we go outside and we interview him in front of the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Right. And, and uh, Roberto Lopez, who's one of my mo- mentors in filmmaking, he's a, he's a he, he, he's under the Sammo Hung like lineage. You know, he's one of those uh, Colombian brother that loved Chinese martial arts like I did. And he got in with the right circle. But but he happened to be there at that day. It was like a bunch of martial arts people came to this and he filmed me interviewing Gordon. And it's a beautiful interview, man. And, and he says some great things. You know, uh, when, one of the things that he was a huge fan of Bruce Lee. He had a huge respect for Bruce. Uh, he, had, he had good reasons. And actually, I agree with every single one of them. And then when we talked about Crunching Tiger, um, he kind of like thought about it. He said, you know, I got, I've seen it. I liked it, you know, but like we've done this movie before, like several times. And he wasn't wrong, you know, and we, we're fans. So we know exactly what he meant, you know. Um, and, and, and shout out to Bay Logan, man, the sequel to Crouching Tiger. I actually absolutely loved. I, I loved the location, the, the way they did it. it. It was a great homage to the original. You know, it had a very different tone, which was it was supposed to, but it was one of those things that th- these types of wuxia films, um, I know that I fell in love with martial arts because there was a magic uh, of Asia, you know, that was connected to it and the culture and, the, and there's a beauty that's there that, you know, and, and, and a history and the preservation of that history and that ancestry. I think when it, when it comes to all people of color that have some type of a history, Boricuas, you know, people from Africa, you know, we have this respect for ancestry and preservation of that history. And when that's taken away from you, you know, and you have to kind of research it to get it back, you know, that becomes a, there's a disparity in that kind of, uh, that type of knowing yourself. So for me, the Tai Chi and, and Chinese martial arts in particular help to fill that void you know, for many people who have lost some connection because there is a family hierarchy in Chinese martial arts that I absolutely adore, you know, you know, like, you know, Dai Si Gong, you know, you know, Daga, big brother, you know, like I love that whole aspect of the, of the culture. And one of the uh, really great friends of ours that uh, got rest his soul that he passed was uh, the rock and roll singer Lou Reed, who was a huge fan of Chen style Tai Chi and, and just really a great practitioner himself. He really kind of devoted himself to, to the, the art form but but Lou also understood the hierarchy man there was a this is how cool Lou Reed is man we my teacher did a presentation at Carnegie Hall and he was the first time ever a Chinese martial arts presentation on, on the stage of Carnegie Hall and they were playing rock and roll with Lou Reed and my teacher performing Tai Chi and it was this great show that they did we go backstage Ruben Blades it's a Bridget Belzer you know and these are all people that were backstage and Lou was introducing me and Stefan as his brothers, like, oh, these are my Tai Chi brothers. Uh, but he's like so proud of that, man. And he, you know, and we're like almost embarrassed about it, you know, because we're like, oh man, you know, we're like, a, you know, like, oh, Lou, man, you're being like too, too generous, you know. And, and you know, so he's introducing to all these, and you know, it, it was just the coolness about that he he knew he was down with something that was very special. And Master Ren preserved this very interesting history because of his teacher, Chen Shaowang, Grandmaster Chen Shaowang. And, and there's this really interesting history that he was trying to maintain and preserve here in the West, and, you know. Well, I think, you know, I think it's, always, it's always, no matter what style, at the higher level, there's so right, much Right, absolutely. So much right. And, and that's why I always tell my students that there's no superior style, styles or languages. No right. language is superior than another language. It's mm. just how do you want to express yourself, right? Right, and absolutely. That's, that, and, and you know, my my Sifu Wai Si Wang, you know, he's he he's known for having really good Hong Gab, but then people sometimes will see his Tai Chi and say, well, why is he doing that Tai Chi stuff? And what they don't understand is one of the reasons his Hong Gab is so good is because he investigated uh-huh. Tai Chi. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then cut to 20 years later, um, Warrington Hudlin introduced me to this young brother that was doing a film that I was working on. And he said, you two should work together on this movie because it's about Chinese martial arts and black folks and, and Latinos and, and their interests in the subject. And the way the movie came about is because Fred Ho, my mentor, asked me a question. And he was like, Jose, what is it about Chinese martial arts specifically that Latinos and Blacks just love, you know, what is it about this stuff? And I was like, that's a good question. And I went down the list of what I loved about martial arts, et cetera. And that uh, thesis, you know, like two, three page uh, written piece that was he was going to publish in, a, in, a, in some type of academic journal 
Um, it never got published, you know, but it became the blueprint for a movie that we ended up doing called Urban Dragons. And it was, it was called Blacks and Latinos in Chinese Martial Arts. And it, it just features a plethora of people that have been doing Chinese martial arts and their stories and the journey of, uh, you know, how this, this changed our lives, you know, in, in some way, shape or form. And Stefan Berwick is a part of that. There's a brother named Oso Tayer Cassell, one of the first Amer uh, African-American guys to be doing Chinese martial arts before anybody thought it was cool. You know, like he was he was fighting against karate guys, you know, like in his Tai Chi or Kung Fu uniforms. And, you know, he was legit like a, a hero, you know. And uh, then other people came like Philip Redman, who does Wing Chun. Uh, he, he actually was a fan of Oso and he mentions him in the documentary. And, and he had some great stories because he's ex-Marine, you know. And uh, then he has a student named Rashawn Herkel. And I get to meet both of them. And, and, I, and you know, when you have a teacher student, uh, uh, it's it, it, you know, it's a teacher-student relationship, it's unbreakable. They have the best bond I've ever seen. Like that, that respect is, you know, and, and you know, and there are other masters I think that, that love these traditions and, and preserve them. But but it's, it's basically almost like, you know, when you're an older man, but your your mind is like a kid, like you're, you're and I, I'm not saying that in a disparaging way, I'm saying it in a really good way that you have, you, you have imagination. You, there's a brightness in your eye, you know, and Gong Fu does that for us, I think. You know, there's something about that magic, that, that youthful, why did, you know, and it preserves a certain, you know, I don't know. It's just, that's what it does for me. That's, that's how I would speak to it, you know. You but, know uh, since we're mm -hmm. talking Tai Chi, um, what comic book character, superhero or villain, what's a character that would use Tai Chi? Mm. <laughs> that's a good idea. Let, let me see. Uh, in terms of philosophy and, and mindfulness, right? Dr. Strange. Oh, yeah. Dr. Uh -huh. Strange, in terms of what he has to do, his the alchemy, knowing formulas, knowing you know the philosophy. You know, it's there's there's that that metaphysical aspect that Tai Chi is known for, which I don't like. You know, where oh, you could send someone twenty feet with just thinking about it. Like, no, that's not how it works. That's not how the force works. <laughs> you know, that scene with Harrison Ford. It, 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 that's sort of my take on the Tai Chi. It's like, no, it's not magical. There's real physics behind it. Every discipline has the same physics. Uh, the expression of it is unique. You know, there's something about the magic of that. And so when I see Dr. Strange, you know, doing what he's doing, he's got to think so quickly to, to make all these these things happen instantly. It, it, and that's sort of how you have to think in Tai Chi. It's like playing a very quick game of chess, you know, and, you, and you're moving, you know. So, so, so Dr. Strange would be my go-to superhero, you know. He is and, a master of mystic arts, so it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. We've uh, segued into comics. I know mm -hmm. you also have a little bit of a connection with that too, with a mm -hmm. certain comic that uh, titled, well, there's two, but the first one I should mention, right, is uh, your comic Shadow Lords, as well <laughs> as the other comic Black Soft, but we can get to that one next. Well, well, let's um, both. well I, I'm definitely going to talk about both of them because my, uh, my brother, uh, you know, Owen Ratliff has this. Uh, I, I would say if I had to describe them, it's like the black James Bond, but written that way. You know, it's not like how they had James Bond and they said, well, let's just insert another actor into that role. Like he created a character that uh, had a Shaolin background. Um, there's this big, great, like uh, origin story. And the comic book just really captured that. And in, 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 in he broke it into four different comics and eventually it became or it will become a graphic novel. And a feature film, he actually did this mini feature that Ben Ramsey directed, which is, and I love Ben Ramsey's blood and bone, and you know, and so I'm a huge fan of his work, and for to know that he was directing the film, Arnold Chung did the action, so he had this great acrobatic stuff, and later on, these guys all went to bigger and better things, man, but but Black Salt started with this comic book concept idea of a, of a black superhero slash secret agent um, saying Samuel Tharp, and, and this character is kind of like uh, the black salt part of it is that he ended up in China. Um, I don't want to give away too much of the plot points, but 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 it's a comic book that's worth a, a really good read, and and it's independently produced, you know. And uh, you know the owner, creator, Ra Ra um, Owen is is also my partner with with Shadow Lords and all the stuff that I'm working on. So whatever films we work collaboratively, we're trying to package these things to get some 
information out about these independent types of comic books and you know and ways of, of getting them either to publishers or you know saying hey we want to take our published material and use the intellectual property to turn it into a film or a video game or a, a role play game or you know so there's ways of uh, merchandising it and packaging it and Owen is just a genius at that he's been able to synthesize a really interesting platform to promote the, the brand of, of Black Salt, you know, and, and the nice thing about it is also there's a video game that he put together. It's just amazing. Like the graphics are great. And then uh, he got connected somehow with Wu-Tang, like the Wu-Tang Clan. It's this thing with the sneaker. It's like a one of a kind sneaker. And he has the Black Salt thing connected to something else. And Wu-Tang and RZA came through and they liked the track so much. They say, you know what, let's throw RZA in there. And they recorded like this cool little music video where RZA is going to be uh, featured. And, and it's uh, kind of like hip hop kung fu culture. You know, it's, if anyone is that, you know, you remember your magazine had him on the cover with Chi Young Man, oh, yeah. you know? You know? And, yeah, and it, was yeah. a great, it was a great article, you know? But see, those stories, man, these are people that are legit fans of comic books and fans of martial art. And, and that's sort of what, what uh, I think Owen was able to capture with this character. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a really cool concept. And mine is more of a Tai Chi master kind of thing. So you get a Shaolin trope with like so, but the Tai Chi one is imagine Lao Tzu and Sung Tzu, like if they had a temple and the temple's called the Sanctuary of Enlightenment. And as teachers, you know, one of them is hardcore Shaolin. The other one is very gentle, very Tai Chi, like, you know, the way Tai Chi is known. And, and, and in there, they have these eight children that they have to train and they have to teach them certain things about martial art and then they have to trade those kids at a certain age and, and you know and, and if you're set in your ways and you're hard-headed whatever and now you got to be gentle and you know it's not going to work so it's kind of like this interesting and so what i ended up doing is i wanted to tell a story that would show them as children so i had an animated tv series to, to do that story then for the adult part of the film that would be the feature film, Shadow Lords, which is based on the actual graphic novel. And in that graphic novel, they're already adults. So there's not back, there's no backstory about them as young kids. And, but the goal for me would be to always do the kids' story in a really cool animated way, you know, and, and, and as a comic book. But the actual full feature comic, uh, Bo Wilkins... Um, uh, was the leader uh, of the production. He has a great team behind it, him and his wife, Rachel. Um, they, they've been doing this comic book with me since, I like to say, 2005. You know, and, and it's been a uh, work in progress, you know, a labor of love. Um, you know, we're all putting sweat equity into this stuff. As, you know, me and Owen have been doing this stuff forever. And, uh, you know, as independent filmmakers, as independent film and, and comic book uh, publishers, you know, you're trying to kind of get a story out that uh, appeals to what your love and interest is. It's kind of like what you're doing with your work, you know, that there's a passion for art, and but there's also a combination of art, you know, mixed with martial art, you know, and, and there's some philosophies in there that you can tell. And, you know, the age group that you're targeting, man, that's an important age group. And that's one of the things that I, I did kindergarten through eighth grade in the Board of Education. That book would have flied off like the handles because, you know, I could see that being in the lesson plan, you know, life lessons you know kung fu is all about life lessons man and you know and i think kids are missing you know that the importance of that and not that sports doesn't teach that because I'm, I'm a fan of western sports um, but there, there's also this uh, this uh, western culture that's a little too aggressive you know too hyper masculine and there's no humility behind that masculinity and i think what makes martial arts unique is that is that ability that we have to, to be able to be humble even in the face of adversity and being able to check ourselves because we know that the training that we've done, you could actually hurt someone doing this stuff if you, if you choose to lose it. And, and I think when you have comic books that address that or movies that address that, that there's always this restraint for that reason. Well, no, I was just going to say, you know, what, what Jose was elaborating on earlier about the difference between Kung Fu and just kind of the Western sports kind of dynamic that we're right. all brought up is the, the thing that's so beautiful about Kung Fu is because it's so much about self-discovery is this concept that for me to win doesn't mean you have to lose. And that's yeah, kind of, I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, yeah. and and when you say humility, I mean that's one of the biggest things my Sifu used to say. And it's like when you say that that is Kung Fu, right? It's right. it's having the ability to do these potentially destructive things, but having the restraint not to right. right? Power is yes. not good without restraint. It's it's useless. And 
And I always feel like that's where bullying comes in, right? Bully, a bully is what happens when the coward gets power, right? Yes, that's, right, right. Actually, maybe before we, 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 we shut the whole thing down, maybe we can go around and everybody can kind of give their social media and where can, people can contact you and stay updated on your projects. Um, you know, maybe we'll start with uh, Jose. Maybe you could share where people can find you online and kind of keep track of your, of your all your um, You know, well, I, I've been, this is a year that I'm going to kind of launch a lot of my social media platforms. But at this time, it's going to be just strictly Facebook. Um, but eventually, I'll have a specific website on Facebook that's strictly Shadow Lords, the comic book, you know, and actually we'll launch that. But um, but at this point, it's Jose Figueroa on, on Facebook. And you'll see I will usually post stuff about martial arts. I share a lot of other people's work and and what have you. Um, and that's for now the only place platform that I can kind of put the word out on. OK, great, great. And, and, and we'll be happy to share once the Shadow Lords uh, websites that we'll share it on our social yeah, media. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I'll have all that, you know, in place, you know, a lot of it is just building and working quietly to be able to express something physically later, you know, absolutely. we're manifesting. <laughs> Definitely. And, and, uh, and Patrick, how about yourself? Where can people keep uh, in touch with you and updated on all your projects? Well, on, on the socials, I'm at Plugo, P-L-U-G-O, or at Plugo Arts. Um, you can find my website, PlugoArts.com, and you should definitely keep an eye out for my graphic novel, A Tiger's Tale, where you can find updates at atigerstale.com, and that's tale spelled T-A-L-E. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> For myself, um, you know, um, I found out about Linktree, so I'll put a Linktree with all the different links in the description. But the main things um, for my Kung Fu school, uh, we're teaching online courses now. So it's tigercrane.net uh, and tigercrane805 on YouTube and Instagram. Thank you. Love and, it. And, love it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and for my comic book, it's uh, Shadow Ghost Comic, one word. That's on Instagram and Facebook. So that's where you can find me. So uh, without further ado, uh, thank you very much for joining us, and um, we'll all see everybody next time. So, thank, thank you, Patrick. Nice to meet you. Thank all you, right. Curtis. Thank you, Chris. Hello, I'm Sifu Curtis Fujita with Tiger Crane Kung Fu. Just wanted to let everybody know that we do have an online program that we're utilizing, not just for our enrolled students that come to our physical location, but also for students who are in other states, other time zones, other countries. That's a unique program with multiple components uh, that really help you learn Kung Fu and Tai Chi at home during the current health epidemic and beyond. So we have different components. The first part is, of course, the Zoom classes. We have online Zoom classes that meet throughout the week for Kung Fu and Tai Chi. Uh, we also have a unique thing, which we call our rerun program. And what that means is we record the Zoom classes and we have an archive of dozens and dozens of videos for you to access at any time, anywhere, as long as you have an internet connection. So if you missed a class, you can go ahead and follow along and check it out or if you want to remember something that was mentioned in class you can go back and watch the rerun it's an archive uh, for all enrolled members also we have uh, personal videos and what i mean by that is if you film yourself doing an individual technique you can send it to me and i'll be happy to shoot my own video with a response detailing specifically uh, what you want to do to improve the exercise and do it most efficiently and lastly, we even have a social club component. And what that essentially means is, you know, when you're at a gym or a martial arts studio, it's that sense of community, the ability to visit with your classmates, with your teacher after class to, you know, socialize. So we have a social club meeting. So once a week after class, we have a Zoom session and we talk for a little bit and catch up with each other and socialize. So these are all the different components that make our unique online Kung Fu program. If you're interested, feel free to reach me at my email address. It's instructor at tigercrane.net. Again, instructor at tigercrane.net. We would love to see you in our online studio. Thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you and take care.